Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, CIA Director Bill Burns, FBI Director Chris Ray, Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Research at the State Department, Brett Holmgren, Director of National Security Agency, General Timothy Hawk, and Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA Director, Lieutenant General Jeffrey uh, Cruz. Thank you for appearing today before the Senate Intelligence Committee's annual Worldwide Threats Hearing. It is important for Congress and for the American people to hear directly from the leaders of our intelligence community about the threats and challenges facing the United States. I'd like to first acknowledge the women and men of the U.S. intel community. Most Americans will never see the work you do behind the scenes, but be assured that the members of this committee know its importance, and we thank you for what we do to keep America safe. The threat environment today is perhaps one of the most challenging we've seen in recent years. We see nations backsliding from democratic institutions. We see authoritarian systems seeking to impose their will upon neighbors while looking to undermine the international system that has been guarantor of security and stability since World War II. And we see the rise in competition around new technologies. We must ensure that our institutions, including the IC, evolve to meet these new challenges, which means, in my mind, redefining what we think of as national security. The IC was built to collect measures of hard power, how many ships, planes, and military personnel an adversary might have. But the nature of strategic competition today revolves as much about not only traditional military power, but around non-traditional tools and the ability to harness emerging dual-use technologies. For example, advanced communication networks can provide ubiquitous connectivity, but also ubiquitous surveillance. surveillance. Artificial intelligence can accelerate, accelerate software development, but can also accelerate malicious cyber attacks or the spread of misinformation. Biotechnology advancements may lead one day to curing cancer or eliminating famine, but also may create new pathogens, or even, as some have warned, genetically engineered super soldiers. And access to rare earth minerals may help determine who shapes the energy future for the whole world. Compounding all of this, the nature of conflict increasingly allows adversaries to project power through asymmetrical means. For example, cyber attacks can disable critical infrastructure from thousands of miles away and are increasingly available to a widening array of actors. Inexpensive, unmanned systems, drones, can threaten multi-billion dollar ships. We are now even seeing the possibility of foreign adversaries weaponizing space in ways that could be massively destructive, not only to our national security, but to our way of life and useful tools such as GPS and satellite communications. Similarly, misinformation and disinformation are increasingly deployed cheaply by an array of adversarial actors. We all know that more than 60 countries, over half the world's population, will vote this year. And I am deeply concerned that democracy, including in the United States, is under greater threat than ever from these foreign adversaries. Bad actors like Russia are particularly incentivized to interfere given what's at stake in Ukraine. Poll after poll increasingly demonstrate that Americans are distrustful of traditional sources of information. And while AI provides the tools to spread sophisticated misinformation, at an unprecedented speed and scale. Admits these threats, our ability to respond has been hamstrung, hamstrung. As recent lit litigation pending before the Supreme Court has had a chilling effect on the voluntary sharing of information related to foreign malign influence threats between US government agencies and social media companies. So today, I would like each of our witnesses to report on how their agencies and the IC as a whole are prepared 
and poised to meet these technology-based challenges. And what more needs to be done? Yet, even with this new landscape, more traditional national security challenges remain. Terrorist groups still threaten our homeland. Over the last couple of years, we've seen authoritarian powers challenging democratic norms, undermining the international order, and intimidating their neighbors. The People's Republic of China under Xi Jinping has presented an unprecedented challenge, a techno-authoritarian behemoth whose economy is intertwined with our own, challenging democratic values, leader, US leadership, and global institutions. Often using enormous government subsidies, China has used its substantial investment power to lead or attempt to dominate a range of key industries, whether it be telecommunications and Huawei, social media and TikTok, or genomics in BGI. Another authoritarian adversary, Russia, under Putin, has continued its brutal invasion of Ukraine, illegally using military forces to seize territory. Ukrainians have bravely been fending off the Russian military for over two years, supported by partners around the world. The Russian military has suffered severe losses of men and equipment, a fact that close to 87% of Russia's pre-war ground forces have been taken out of the conflict by either being killed or wounded. And now, as a result of his aggression, Putin faces what he has always feared, a NATO more united than ever. That said, this war is at a critical phase with a serious imbalance of equipment. And my fear is the decision thus far by the House of Representatives not to even take up legislation that would support Ukraine in their fight against Putin aggression has been one of the most short-sighted decisions on a national security issue that I can possibly imagine. Without this assistance, Ukrainian defenses will be disastrously undermined, as well as global confidence in America's resolve will be undermined. And that will be the case whether it comes from Putin in Europe or the PRC in Taiwan. And as we convene this hearing, we also face continued instability in the Middle East. The horrific terrorist attacks against Israel civilians by Hamas on October 7th have been followed by an incursion by Israel that has cost an estimated 30,000 Palestinians their lives. And while Iran and its key partners, such as Hezbollah, appeared to be deterred from widening the conflict for now, other Iranian proxies, such as the Houthis in Yemen and Iraqi Shia militias, have attempted to expand their conflict and drag in our country. At the same time, Israel's war against Hamas has shown the difficulty of using military force alone to eradicate a non-state actor embedded in a civilian population especially one that has been so adept at using underground tunnels. And I worry that Prime Minister Netanyahu's conduct in the war threatens to undermine support for Israel in the long term, including in the United States. This international support has been key to Israel's security. And as a longtime friend of Israel, this has a great concern to me for even Israel's support in the United States. In addition, we convene this timely hearing as Congress faces a pressing deadline on a key national security program. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provides unique and critical foreign intelligence necessary to protect our national security, enabling the IC to prevent and thwart terrorist attacks, track foreign spies, uncover economic espionage, protects US troops, expose human and drug trafficking, and disrupt foreign cyber attacks. Allowing this program to lapse would critically damage our national security. In closing, we face an increasing array of diversity of challenges, but we also have an opportunity to reinvigorate America's democratic values in face of autocracies like China and Russia. We cannot take for granted either democracy or the, the international system that has kept Americans safe for decades. Maintaining both requires leadership, conviction, and sacrifice. With that, let me now turn to the Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming here today. And I also extend my thanks to the men and women who work underneath you that do the important work of 
of keeping our country safe at um, what I think you could describe as one of those pivot moments in history where what life will be like for a generation is being determined by what's happening now and in the near future while events are changing perhaps faster than any other time in, in human history. I think it's hard, I think we have to remind ourselves if we're gonna talk about the specific threats, the what's, of the why, the, the bigger outline picture of why things are happening the way they are happening because I do think that uh, they are all interrelated. So from the end of the Cold War, I don't know when the end date is, but let's say the late 2000s, um, we lived in a unipolar world. The United States was basically the only country in the world that could project power everywhere at every time. And we were called upon to do many things uh, in regards to that. Um, but other nation states progressed during that stage. And I still think America, by far, by every measure you can imagine, economically, culturally, militarily, remains the world's strongest nation and should remain that way for the foreseeable future if we make the right choices. That order that, we've just, that I just described is being challenged. It's being challenged by nation states that frankly don't like the way the world looks now. At least they think it benefits America and it hurts them. And they want to remake a new world, perhaps even replace the world that they think is beneficial to America and our democratic allies uh, with an alternative, if, if not at least a, uh, a replacement, uh, this new order that they seek. The Chinese, they believe we're in inevitable decline and that their rise is inevitable as well. Um, like I said, they don't like the rules of the world as they believe were written by America and our allies, and so they increasingly are taking it upon themselves at every opportunity to challenge them. They, at, at every domain, they steal our ideas on innovation and so forth so that their companies can do the things that we do, but of course do it cheaper and flood markets with those products. I don't need to tell this panel or the members of this committee and the general public that they're expanding their military capabilities in an extraordinary way uh, to include not simply projecting power in the Indo-Pacific, but around the world. They, uh, by the way, they manipulate loopholes in our laws and in our systems in this country to buy up land, buy up companies, uh, gain strategic advantage in industries, and undermine our industries in return. They are a major part of flooding this country with deadly drugs that are destroying communities and ravaging entire families. And uh, they've also gotten very good at hiring lobbyists and even deputizing the corporate industry, corporate America, to come up here and lobby us for things that are beneficial to the Chinese goals at the expense of this country long term. And I think it's important to mention here today, they also happen to control. Anybody says they don't, doesn't know what they're talking about because every company in China is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. They happen to control a company that owns the world's, uh, one of the world's best artificial intelligence um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms. It's the one that's used in this country by TikTok. And it uses the data of Americans to basically read your mind and predict what videos you want to see. The reason why TikTok is so successful, the reason why it's so attractive, is because it knows you better than you know yourself. And the more you use it, the more it learns. The problem is not TikTok or the videos. The problem is the algorithm that powers it is controlled by a company in China that must do whatever the Chinese Communist Party tells them to do. And the only way that that algorithm works is if that company in China, under the control of the Chinese government, is given access to the data that TikTok collects. TikTok does not work without that algorithm. And that algorithm is controlled by a company that's controlled by the Chinese Communist Party under the law of China. In the case of uh, Putin, he also, he actually sees America as decadent and in decline, and he views China, uh, Russia as resilient. They view themselves as a great power, and he believes that great powers have a right to buffer states. He believes that great powers have a right not just to have their own borders, but to control the countries around their borders as buffer states. I think they already have that in Belarus in his mind, and it is one of the reasons why he invades Ukraine. In the case of Iran, they want to export their Shia Islamic revolution to the entire Middle East. And the problem with this is two things standing in their way, the state of Israel and the United States of America. And so that is why they have proxy groups in places like Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Gaza, who they use for their purposes. One of their purposes is to use these groups now to attack Americans so that we will say it's not worth the trouble, we need to get out of there. And once we leave, then they'll move on Jordan and on Bahrain. Then they'll make Israel an unlivable place. And ultimately, their ambitions are the entire region and most of the Gulf kingdoms. 
That's why I think it's a mistake to view the hor horrific events of October 7th as simply the latest iteration of a longstanding Israeli-Palestinian problem. It is deeply tied to the head of this snake, and the head of this snake is in Iran and in Tehran. Add to all of these three countries North Korea. We haven't heard a lot about it yet. They have become increasingly aggressive. In fact, I would argue that we perhaps are closer to some ho armed hostilities than we've been in a decade or longer. Um, why? Why have become so aggressive? They feel empowered. They feel empowered because Putin is buying things from them and helping them to break their international isolation, and also because I don't know what percentage of their economy is powered by uh, ransomware attacks and cyber hacking, but it's substantial. They generate a lot of money from that. And then add to all these parades of horribles the fact that terror is still a threat. Iran, as has been publicly reported, is still trying to kill former government officials that live in the United States of America. There are former government officials in this country, no longer in office, who require 24 hours a day security because Iran is trying to kill them inside the United States. Hezbollah, an agent of Iran, is also looking for ways to conduct terrorist attacks against American interests and Israeli and Jewish interests all over the world and here in the homeland as well. By the way, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are not out of business. They are still involved at Al-Shabaab to that. They also want to kill Americans. If they could do it in the homeland, they would love that. And all of that happening at a time in which perhaps the single largest, most eventful migration corridor in history is operating right off of our border. So I think it's a mistake sometimes to divide all of these problems geographically, because in some ways, they're all interrelated in key ways. Yes, these individual states all have different ambitions, but they share a common goal. And the common goal is a world friendlier and better for them and their interests, and a world in which America is weakened and less able to act. And all of these crises begin to interlock in a way that help them. For example, the Chinese and the Russians are probably see great benefit. No, not probably. They do see great benefit what's happening in the Middle East, because they figure every dollar and every second of our attention that's paid there is we're not paying to what's happening with Ukraine, and we're not paying to the Indo-Pacific. Um, the Chinese see great benefit in Ukraine as well, because they view it as the more time and money we spend there, the less time and money and focus we have on them. In fact, one of the things I know the Chinese hope for is one of two things. A, we deplete ourselves in Ukraine or and or the Middle East, particularly Ukraine, or B, we cut and run, and then they can go around the world. See, I told you America's weak. I told you America's unreliable. They have a plan for either outcome, which makes it challenging for us as we decide what to do here. Um, so th these things all come together, and I think that's really the overarching threats that we face is an understanding that none of these should be viewed in isolation. The goals that Russia has, the goal that Iran has, the goal that North Korea has, the role that the Chinese have may be different goals. But one of the th real developments that threaten the security of our country is that they are increasingly partnering with one another. Not a NATO alliance, not the sort of formal alliance that's written out, but they are increasingly partnering with each other at, on selected topics and at selected opportunities because they all share one goal, and that is they want to weaken America, weaken our alliances, weaken our standing and our capability and our will because it helps them to achieve the world as they envision it, the world that they want but it comes at our expense and at the expense of all that's been built over the last 20 or 30 years. So um, I think that uh, one of the greatest dangers we face is the inability to see how all these things are interconnected. And I think one of the greatest challenges we face is to deal with them as if they are interconnected. I, I think that what life will be like on this planet for the next generation will be determined very much by what we do or fail to do here over the next two to three years and certainly with the issues that are before us today. So I, I look forward to hearing from all of you and I appreciate you coming. Thank you, Senator Rubio. I think Director Haynes, I believe you're up first. Thank you very much. Chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today alongside my wonderful colleagues to present the IC's annual threat assessment. And before I start, I also want to thank publicly the people of the intelligence community. From the collector to the analyst and everybody in between, we're really presenting the result of their labor at this hearing. And they work tirelessly every day to keep our country safe and prosperous, and we are all very proud to represent them here today. 
I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for the extraordinary support that you've shown to the intelligence community. The IC's relationship with its oversight committees is quite obviously critically important, and you all work with us on a bipartisan basis, and that is especially inspiring in today's environment. We're grateful for your encouragement and for your wisdom. Today, the United States faces an increasingly complex and interconnected threat, as has been noted by the chairman and vice chairman, environment characterized by really three categories of challenges. The first is an accelerating strategic competition with major authoritarian powers that are actively working to undermine the rules-based order and the open international system the United States and our partners rely on for trade, commerce, the free flow of information, and accountability to the truth. The second category. Just, I recognize people feel passionately but the American people deserve to hear from the leaders of the intelligence community. Director Haynes, continue. Okay. The second category is a set of more intense and unpredictable transnational challenges, such as climate change, corruption, narcotics trafficking, health security, terrorism, and cybercrime, cyber crime that often interact with traditional state-based political, economic, and security challenges. And the third category is regional and localized conflicts that have far-reaching and at times cascading implications, not only for neighboring countries, but also for the world. And all three challenges are affected by trends in new and emerging technologies, environmental changes, and economic strain that are stoking instability and making it that much more challenging for us to forecast developments and their implications. These dynamics are putting unprecedented burdens on the institutions and the relationships that the United States relies on to manage such challenges, and perhaps more than ever, frankly, highlight the need for sustained US leadership to uphold the rules-based order. And I'll just touch on these three categories of challenges, starting with strategic competition in China, in an effort to provide some context and highlight some of the intersections. President Xi continues to envision China as a leading power on the world stage, and Chinese leaders believe it is essential to project power globally in order to be able to resist US pressure, for they are convinced that the United States will not tolerate a powerful China. Nevertheless, the PRC seeks to ensure China can maintain positive ties to the United States and will likely continue to do so this year as they see stability in our relationship as important to their capacity to attract foreign direct investment. Boosting the domestic economy is a fundamental priority for President Xi, yet he appears to be doubling down on a long-term growth strategy that will deepen public and investor pessimism over the near term. With youth unemployment around 14.9%, no major stimulus aimed at consumption forthcoming, massive local debts and a property market contraction, 2024 is likely to be another difficult year for China's economy, all against the backdrop of an aging and shrinking population and slowing economic growth. And President Xi is counting on China's investments in technologies such as advanced manufacturing and robotics, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, to drive productivity gains and spur future growth. Yet he is increasingly concerned about the United States' ability to interfere with China's technological goals. Consequently, in an effort to protect and promote China's capacity to compete technologically, which President Xi views as fundamental to his long-term growth strategy, PRC leaders modified their approach to economic retaliation against the United States over the last year, imposing at least some tangible costs on U.S. firms, even as they continue to moderate such actions to avoid domestic costs. And Chinese leadership is furthermore pursuing a strategy to boost China's indigenous innovation and technological self-reliance, expand their efforts to acquire, steal, or compel the production of intellectual property and capabilities from others, including the United States, and continue to engage in coercive behavior to control critical global supply chains of relevance. In the meantime, President Xi's emphasis on control and central oversight is unlikely to solve the challenges posed by China's economic and endemic corruption, demographic decline, and structural economic constraints. And over the coming year, tension between these challenges and China's aspirations for greater geopolitical power will probably become all the more apparent. 
Given its ambitions, Beijing will continue to use its military forces to intimidate its neighbors and to shape the region's actions in accordance with the PRC's priorities. We expect the PLA will field more advanced platforms, deploy new technologies, and grow more competent in joint operations with a particular focus on Taiwan and the Western Pacific. And the role intended for China's growing nuclear forces and cyber capabilities in this effort and the ultimate intent behind unprecedented growth in these areas remain a priority for us in the IC, and they are not unrelated to actions of Russia. President Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine continues unabated. Ukraine's retreat from Ovika and their struggle to stave off further territorial losses in the past few weeks have exposed the erosion of Ukraine's military capabilities with the declining availability of external military aid. The assistance that is contemplated in the supplemental is absolutely critical to Ukraine's defense right now. And without that assistance, it is hard to imagine how Ukraine will be able to maintain the extremely hard fought advances it has made against the Russians, especially given the sustained surge in Russian ammunition production and purchases from North Korea and Iran. And meanwhile, President Putin is increasing defense spending in Russia, reversing his longstanding reluctance to devote a high percentage of GDP to the military as he looks to rebuild. In many ways, this is prompted by the fact that Russia has paid an enormous price for the war in Ukraine. Not only has Russia suffered more military losses than in any time since World War II, roughly 300,000 casualties and thousands of tanks and armored combat vehicles setting them back years, it has also precipitated Finland and Sweden's membership in NATO, which Putin believes requires an expansion of Russia's ground forces. Putin continues to judge that time is on his side and almost certainly assumes that a larger, better equipped military will also serve the purpose of driving that point home to Western audiences. Such messaging is important because Putin's strategic goals remain unchanged. He continues to see NATO enlargement and Western support to Ukraine as reinforcing his long-held belief that the United States and Europe seek to restrict Russian power and undermine him. And of course, in the meantime, Russia continues to modernize and fortify its nuclear weapons capabilities, even though it maintains the largest and most diverse nuclear weapons stockpile. We remain concerned that Moscow will put at risk longstanding global norms against the use of asymmetric or strategically destabilizing weapons, including in space and in the cyber domain. Another critical intersection we are monitoring is the relationship, as the Vice Chairman noted, between government of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, which is evolving as these four countries expand collaboration through a web of bilateral and in some cases trilateral arrangements. This growing cooperation and willingness to exchange aid in military, economic, political, and intelligence matters enhances their individual capabilities, enhance, enables them to cooperate on competitive actions, assists them to further undermine the rules-based order, and gives them each some insulation from external international pressure. And nevertheless, we assess these relationships will remain far short of formal alliances or a multilateral axis. Parochial interest, desire to avoid entanglements and wariness of harm and instability from each other's actions will likely limit their cooperation and ensure it advances incrementally, absent direct conflict between one of these countries and the United States. And nevertheless, the power dynamics are shifting among them, and this is creating new challenges. In particular, Russia's need for support in the context of Ukraine has forced it to grant some long-sought concessions to China, North Korea, and Iran with the potential to undermine, among other things, long-held non-proliferation norms. And as I noted in the beginning, intensifying transnational challenges are intersecting with these more traditional threats. For example, with the advent of generative AI, states and non-state actors who are interested in conducting foreign malign influence operations no longer need to master a language to create potentially believable false content. The threat of malign actors exploiting these tools and technologies to undercut US interests and democracy is particularly potent as voters go to the poll in more than 60 elections around the globe this year, as the chairman noted. We have also seen a massive increase in the number of ransomware attacks globally which went up roughly 74% in 2019 
in 2023 from what it was in 2022. And US entities were the most heavily targeted. Many of these are conducted by non-state actors with the Russia-based cyber criminal group Lockbit remaining the most popular ransomware as a service provider. Lockbit was responsible for nearly a quarter of all claimed attacks worldwide, leading to a joint effort by 11 countries to seize its resources and take down its online domains. Transnational criminal organizations and human smuggling operations increasingly exploit migrants through extortion, kidnapping, and human trafficking. And in particular, the threat from illicit drugs remains at historic levels, with Mexican transnational criminal organizations supplying and moving large amounts of synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl, into the United States. More than 100,000 Americans have died from drug-related overdoses during the past year, and most of those deaths have been attributed to illicit fentanyl. And as such, the threat from fentanyl and other synthetic drugs to the health and welfare of everyday Americans remains a top priority for the intelligence community. In the third category, we have multiple regional conflicts with far-reaching implications, perhaps nowhere more obviously than in the Middle East. This crisis in Gaza is a stark example of how regional developments have the potential for broader and even global implications. Now, having lasted for more than five months, the Gaza conflict has roiled the Middle East with renewed instability, presenting new security paradigms and humanitarian challenges while pulling in a range of actors. The conflict has prompted new dynamics, even as it has entrenched old ones. We continue to assess that Hezbollah and Iran do not want to cause an escalation of the conflict that pulls us or them into a full-out war. Yet the Houthis entered the war and were willing to do so without Iran acting first, becoming one of the most aggressive actors in the conflict. And the Iranian-maligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria that have been attacking our forces and have been more focused on the United States than Israel, using the conflict as an opportunity to pursue their own agenda. Moreover, the crisis has galvanized violence by a range of actors around the world, and while it is too early to tell, it is likely that the Gaza conflict will have a generational impact on terrorism. Both al-Qaeda and ISIS, inspired by Hamas, have directed supporters to conduct attacks against Israeli and U.S. interests, and we have seen how it is inspiring individuals to conduct acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobic terror worldwide. In this third category of regional and localized conflicts, we have many more we might discuss, including Haiti and Sudan and what is happening in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and the list goes on. And this finally brings me to 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which will expire on April 19th without congressional action. The intelligence gathered pursuant to Section 702 was essential in preparing this annual threat assessment and is absolutely fundamental to every aspect of our work, as I know you know. 702 provides unique insights into foreign intelligence targets such as foreign adversaries, terrorist organizations, including Hamas, weapons proliferators, spies, malicious cyber actors, and fentanyl tracker, traffickers. And it does so at a speed and reliability that we simply cannot replace with any other authority. And as Congress pursues reauthorization, we understand there will be reforms and we support those that bolster the compliance and oversight regimes in place while preserving the operational agility that is vital to keeping the nation safe. So thank you for your patience and we look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Director Haynes. Let me go. Um, for members, and I, I appreciate it. I know we don't normally do these on Monday. I appreciate everybody coming in. Uh, we will be conducting a closed session um, after uh, this open session, so members should hold any questions on a classified nature until after that. And uh, after the chair and vice chair go through our first round of questions, we'll then recognize members in rounds of five minutes, um, all based on seniority. Director, I, I, I want to, Haynes, I want to start with where you ended up on, on 702. Um, this critical component of um, both law enforcement and the intelligence community expires on April 19th. Uh, Congress needs to act. 60% um, of all the information that goes into the president's daily brief uh, is derived from 702 information, foreigner talking to foreigner in terms of bad guys. Um, one of the things that the vice chairman and I are very proud of is we worked very hard uh, on a reform of Section 702 that we introduced uh, last year, including 16 uh, co-sponsors. Um, a great number of members of this committee are part of, um, of um, that reform effort that, again, looked at trying to make sure where there had been perhaps overzealous use at the FBI in terms of 
who was queried and how things were queried have been um, uh, dramatically constrained. Um, Director Ray, I want to start my question, though, with you. Some have actually said, though, that where we went didn't go far enough, and they would propose a reform that would require agencies to seek a warrant before conducting U.S. person queries. Uh, could you explain what would happen on a practical level, both from the IC side and the law enforcement side, if, if that um, uh, requirement was put in place? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the short answer is that a warrant requirement for us to run U.S. person queries would be untenable and would largely gut the effectiveness of the authority. And I say that for several reasons. First, it would blind us to information already lawfully in our possession that we need to be able to review and act on in a very time-sensitive way to be able to stop terrorist attacks, protect a victim from a cyber attack, warn somebody who is potentially targeted with assassination or kidnapping. Uh, second, in many instances, at the time that the query would be run, we wouldn't have the probable cause that the query term is associated with an agent of a foreign power. That's, that's what the query tells us. Uh, and so you got that problem. And then the third problem is that an awful lot of the places that we're using 702 queries are to assist victims and to present, prevent potential victims from further attacks, whether terrorist attacks, cyber attacks, et cetera. And so uh, in those instances, you'd never be able to get uh, a warrant requirement, even if there were some kind of delay built into it. That alone, uh, for all these threats, which are extremely time sensitive, I think the, the DNI correctly used the term agility, that is the key. And so I would implore Congress uh, not to take that additional step. You mentioned the compliance failures. I've been very clear that the compliance failures that occurred at the FBI uh, are wholly unacceptable, and that's why I put in place a whole host of reforms uh, which are covering everything from training to our systems, approvals, oversight, an office of internal audit. I could go on and on. And those, re those reforms are working. The FISA court itself most recently found 98% compliance and commented on the reforms working. The most recent Justice Department report found the reforms working, 99% compliance. Uh, and so I think legislation that ensures those reforms stay in place, but also preserves the agility and the utility of the tools, what we need to be able to protect the American people. Well, I appreciate that, and I do think, you know, our reform bill had the notion of trust but verify, so that we would literally legislate the reforms um, that have been put in place, add a few others, add some of the uh, additional amicus uh, provisions. We also, um, one of the things I think that has been discovered that the majority of the queries that involve Americans are actually on victim notification. Uh, the very notion of uh, having a, a warrant to have a victim notification is, is contradictory in itself. I, I want to raise another issue that's been, I think that's been appropriately raised, and this is the question around you know, bulk purchase of, uh, of personal data. I think we need to go much further on, on uh, data protection, and I think that has been a failure of this Congress to address in its past. Uh, Director Haynes, I know you've done a study on this, and um, um, my fear is that some of the uh, proposed reforms would actually not limit foreign entities from obtaining this data, but would limit law enforcement. Can you talk to, uh, to the question of uh, bulk data purchases and data brokers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... From our perspective, commercially available information as we sort of think about the entire set of what's out there and what's been discussed in Congress in relation to this is just increasingly critical to the intelligence community's work. And I think, you know, sort of an obvious example of this is uh, commercial imagery and the role that it played, for example, in the context of the invasion of Ukraine. But there's a whole series of other areas where we're purchasing information, such as uh, commercial threat information that's related to cyber security and things like that. And at the same time, we recognize that commercially available information raises new and important issues related to privacy and civil liberties. And this is in 
large part true because you know more of our daily lives are connected digitally um, to the world today than ever before. And an increasing amount of data about individuals and their activities, often perceived as not especially sensitive on its own, is actually available for sale alongside increasingly sophisticated analytic tools that essentially, um, you know, relying on artificial intelligence can actually, in aggregate, raise significant privacy and civil liberties issues that are relevant, which is why we basically said, look, we recognize this is something that is of concern and we want to make sure that we're actually addressing this issue appropriately and responsibly within the intelligence community. So we had a, um, a panel, an external panel, uh, look at this question and really asked them, you know, how and under what circumstances should we use commercially available information? And in particular, to reflect on the existing framework for privacy and civil liberties. We published that report, um, and in fact, Senator Wyden asked us to, and as a consequence, put that out. And as an intelligence community in our um, XCOM, as we call it, all the heads together, agreed that we thought those recommendations made sense, and we have uh, issued IC guidance basically for cataloging commercially available information acquired by IC elements to ensure that our handling of such information is consistent with relevant legal policy security considerations to facilitate oversight, and we've developed a framework that augments each IC's elements, attorney general guidelines and related policies with general principles and additional guidance on how IC elements should access, collect, process commercially available information, including more precise guidance for identifying and dealing with categories of information that pose a greater risk of implicating privacy and civil liberty concerns. And finally, as the panel recommended also, the framework sets out standards and procedures that govern and require periodic reevaluation and acquisition and use decisions. And I think the challenge that is uh, posed by um, some of the legislative uh, proposals that I've seen require, for example, uh, again, a sort of probable cause requirement before you can obtain that information. Similarly, we are not going to have um, in the scenario of, for example, getting uh, cyber threat information com commercially, a probable cause reason for getting that. What we're trying to do is understand what the vulnerabilities are, and then what we recognize is that whatever the commercial information is that we're obtaining, we need to treat it in a way that actually mitigates against the risks that have been described. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Director Ray, uh, we, uh, we know that over the last three years, millions of people um, Across the U.S. border illegally, and many have been released into the country. Um, have members or people with ties to dangerous gangs, like for example the uh, prison gang Tren de Aragua from Venezuela, were they among the people that came into this country? Well, I don't know that I can speak to the specific gang, but certainly we have had dangerous individuals uh, enter the United States of a variety of sorts. Are we now seeing, are we seeing crimes from people that entered the country over the last three years, some of them with ties to gangs or other criminal organizations? Well, I guess what I would say is this. From an FBI perspective, we are seeing a wide array of very dangerous threats that emanate from the border, and that includes everything from the drug trafficking. Uh, the FBI alone seized enough fentanyl in the last two years to kill 270 million people. Uh, that's just on the fentanyl side. An awful lot of the violent crime in the United States uh, is at the hands of gangs who are themselves involved in the distribution of that fentanyl. But, we're, uh, but so we're the, also, you're also seeing and tracking local law enforcement arresting and, and for example, the assault on the police officers in New York all the reporting said they had ties to this gang in particular, but there's no doubt that people that were criminals in their country of origin have crossed that border and are now in the U.S. committing crimes. Correct. Um, is there now a black market emerging to sell? Uh, we've seen reports of a black market emerging selling social, fake Social Security cards, fake green cards. Have you seen reporting on that? Well, uh, certainly there is a, uh, on the dark net, for example, there is a significant marketplace for different kinds of stolen identity. What about in the street? Uh, I think as well. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, well, there are smuggling networks all over the world that specialize in moving people from all over the world, um, including from the Middle East, Central Asia, and so forth. Are we aware of any of these smuggling organizations are run by or... Um, are conducted by people that have ties, for example, to ISIS or other terrorist organizations? 
So I want to be a little bit careful how far I can go in open session, but there, uh, you know, there is a particular network um, that uh, has uh, where some of the overseas facilitators of the smuggling network have ISIS ties uh, that we're very concerned about, uh, and that we've been spending enormous amount of effort with our partners investigating. Um, uh, exactly what that network is up to uh, is something that's again the subject of our current investigation. But. So there is a network we're concerned about that has facilitators involved in it that have ties to ISIS and Correct. other terrorist organizations. Correct. Um, I talked about TikTok in the opening. Uh, just to lay the groundwork here, TikTok is this American, TikTok US, American company or headquartered putatively in America. And they have this platform, which is fascinating, right? And, and people, it's very effective, very good, has a lot of members. One of the things that powers it is that it is powered by an algorithm based on artificial intelligence where the more you use it, the more it learns about you. It, in essence, reads your mind. It knows the kinds of videos you like, and it feeds you more and more of them, causing you to go back. That algorithm is not owned by TikTok. It's owned by ByteDance, a Chinese company, correct? Uh, that's my understanding. And so the only way that algorithm works is if that Chinese company has access to the data being generated by TikTok. The owner of the algorithm, ByteDance, has to have access. So it doesn't matter where the data is stored. Ultimately, they have to have access to it in order to make the algorithm work, correct? Right. I mean, I think what you're getting to is the, the key point is that the parent company is, for all intents and purposes, beholden to the CCP. Well, the reason why I raise that is if, they, if ByteDance in China is the one that owns the driver that makes TikTok effective, isn't it true that under Chinese law, the Chinese Communist Party says that data that you're gaining access to in order to make your algorithm work, we want a copy of that data. If they said that to ByteDance in the future, ByteDance would have to give it to them. That's my understanding. And if they went to them and said, we want you to change your algorithm so that Americans start seeing videos that hurt this candidate or help that candidate in the upcoming election, ByteDance would have to do that under Chinese law. That's my understanding. And if they said, we want you to put out videos that make Americans fight with each other or spread conspiracy theories and get them at each other's throat, ByteDance doesn't have, can't go to Chinese court and fight the Communist Party. They would have to do it. That's my understanding. And I would just add that that kind of uh, influence operation or the different kinds of influence operations you're describing are extraordinarily difficult to detect, which is part of what makes the national security concerns represented by uh, by TikTok, so significant. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and my thanks to all of you and, of course, the people you work with every day. I'm going to start with this issue of government purchases of Americans' data. And former acting CIA director Mike Morell presents something of a different view on this. He has said that the amount of information available for the government to buy would, quote, knock your socks off. And if it were collected <clears throat> through normal intelligence methods, it would be top secret information kept under lock and key. I believe Mr. Morell is right. It is the wild west out there in terms of sensitive information on Americans, and the government can buy it up. Unlike normal intelligence collection, there are apparently virtually no rules here. To take one public example, I want to uh, go to you, uh, General Cruz, not to be going after you especially, but you said that the Defense Intelligence Agency has acknowledged it obtains and purchases actual U.S. location data. So my question for you and any other members who would like to add to it, are there any constitutional or statutory limits on your agency's purchasing of the location information of Americans? Constitutional or statutory limits, any? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Wyden. Uh, I would say yes, there are absolute uh, and very clear guidelines for all of us. And when we purchase the bulk data, uh, the first thing we do is we exclude all of the data uh, that is within U.S. territory and is on U.S. citizens as the very first step. Uh, our teams have been here uh, with the Congress uh, talking through our attorney general guidelines, have been speaking with the concerns that uh, you and others have voiced to us. And I, I think we have built the processes around our um, purchasing of commercial data and use of commercial data in partnership with I you. Respectfully, I didn't hear you mention what I asked about. Mm -hmm. 
either constitutional or statutory limits. So why don't you just send that to us for the record? And I will just say, colleagues, this is the reason why Congress needs to pass legislation limiting government purchases of Americans' information. And I also believe the Congress needs to pass the bill that I introduced with the Vice Chairman, uh, Senator Rubio, making sure this information isn't <coughs> bought up by foreign countries either. So let's go now to Section 702. And obviously, the government needs to have Section 702 to focus on foreign threats. It is just essential that it be done without throwing aside the privacy rights of law-abiding Americans. There is a workable solution. Under a bipartisan proposal that I've been part of, the government wouldn't need a warrant to run searches on Americans to see who they're talking to. It's only when the government wants to read the content of those private conversations that a warrant would be required even though there are also many exceptions that we have put into the bill. Exceptions for emergencies, consent, cyber attacks, the list goes on. Now, according to FBI's data, the FBI looks at content in less than 2% of its searches on Americans. So my question would be for you, Director Ray, as I've described it, using your data, the data from the FBI, doesn't our warrant requirement only apply to a tiny fraction of the searches the, American, the FBI conducts when you factor in all of these exceptions? I mean, I can go through them, but I think you know them. You know, if there's any imminent danger, no warrant. If there are other dangers, you have to go get the warrant later. But the exception list is very long. So the question is, isn't it correct that what we're talking about in the bipartisan bill here in the Senate and in the House it would apply to only a small fraction of the searches you're conducting? Well, I, well, as a percentage, it's not a significant percentage. Certainly the number is significant. And I think the fundamental problem with the warrant requirement before you can look at the content is that it's the content that tells us whether or not it's an agent of a foreign power involved. So I think that's part of the problem that we have. If the witness will, will pause for a moment. Continue. I think where I got cut off was I was just explaining that the, the fundamental problem is that in the instances where we uh, need to look at the content, the probable cause that's lacking at that point is what's established by seeing the content. That's what tells us more often than not that there's an agent of a foreign power involved. And so that's what enables us to then act and go forward with the appropriate investigative steps. So there's an exception for imminent danger. There's an exception for in, in other emergencies. There is an exception uh, to uh, simply conversations with foreign threats. I'd like you to send to me, so we'll have this for the record, how having those exceptions will in some way obstruct you when you're trying to deal with a tiny number of warrants. This is all about Americans believing, you bet we have foreign threats. There's no question about it. But we can address those foreign threats in a way that's compatible with the liberty and the values that law-abiding Americans hold. I'm happy to work with you on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Collins. Thank you. Director Haynes, you understandably spent considerable time talking about the significant threats that Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea pose to our country. Since the way that our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan unfolded, We've also seen a large increase in terrorist attacks conducted by ISIS. In fact, those number nearly 200 and have resulted in some 1,300 casualties. So obviously, Afghanistan has shown that once again, the Taliban is either unwilling or unable to control terrorist groups. Are there threats 
of terrorist attacks from ISIS toward Americans. A problem still, and how are you balancing the great power competition with the threats from ISIS? In addition, I would like you to comment on whether or not terrorist groups backed by Iran, such as Hamas and Hezbollah, pose a threat to our homeland. Thank you, Senator. So in terms of um, the threat from ISIS, which you're absolutely right, remains a, a significant counterterrorism concern for us, um, most of the attacks that you're talking about uh, globally taken on by ISIS have actually occurred by parts of ISIS that are outside of Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, um, there still remains an ISIS concern. It has one where, uh, ironically, uh, the Taliban has actually also concerned about it because the ISIS uh, group that is in Afghanistan is, in fact, going after the Taliban. And, uh, and so this is a place where, um, uh, actually, uh, the Taliban has... Um, has taken action against that group in ways that are consistent with our uh, also concerns and interests. Um, so that is one piece. In terms of the terrorist groups that are backed by Iran, absolutely, that is a major issue for us. And there are a number of them, obviously. We often talk about um, Iranian-aligned militia groups that have been attacking US forces and assets in Iraq and Syria in particular, but also in other uh, parts of the region attempting to. And there have been uh, just uh, dozens and dozens of attacks that we've been looking to manage. And that it continues to be uh, fueled by Iran. They provide uh, weapons. They provide training. They provide money to those groups and um, and we still obviously see them as a destabilizing force in the region. We also see Iran's support of Hezbollah, as you noted, and of Hamas over the years. And, uh, and so considerably, not to mention the Houthis is another example of this, but uh, certainly that's been a, a large issue and my colleagues may wish to add to this. Thank you. Director Ray. We, have, we know that China is the primary provider of the predecessor chemicals and the pill presses for fentanyl, and you've pointed out in your testimony the extraordinary scope of the amount of fentanyl that has been produced. And indeed, 80% of the overdoses in Maine last year involved fentanyl. But what we're also seeing in Maine is a new phenomenon that was reported by some enterprising journalists. And that is that Chinese nationals are establishing illegal marijuana growing operations all over the state. One public report estimates there are more than 200 of them, primarily in rural Maine. They're unregulated, they're illicit, uh, they're destroying homes because they're growing the marijuana inside, and the marijuana is very potent. What is the FBI doing to support local county and state officials, and why do you think the Chinese have, have sent their citizens to rural America to establish these illegal growing operations? Well, uh, certainly we're observing uh, the same phenomenon that you're describing. I know we've had a number of cases that have resulted in indictments uh, of Chinese nationals involved with illegal marijuana grow operations here um, and otherwise involved in different kinds of organized criminal activity. We are tackling that through working with our state and local law enforcement partners through a variety of task forces. We're trying to share intelligence with them uh, to help uh, get ahead of the threat. Um, I'm not sure that I could give you a reason as to why it's happening, uh, but that is something that we're uh, very focused on. You mentioned the precursors to fentanyl, the pill presses, this issue. I would just add to that uh, yet another one, which is that uh, an awful lot of the meth 
precursors to the labs in Mexico also come from China. So it's fentanyl, it's also meth. Um, and so there is a certainly a, a big degree to which problems that we are experiencing here in an acute way source back to them. Senator Heinrich. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, according to the annual threat assessment, Russian President Putin probably believes, quote, that his approach to winning the war in Ukraine is paying off and the Western and U.S. support to Ukraine is finite, end quote. Uh, for any of you, what lessons is Putin taking from the U.S. failure to further support Ukraine in its fight for national survival? And what lessons might China's Xi Jinping learn from this failure? Um, Senator, I'd be glad to address your question. Um, I just returned from my 10th visit to Ukraine during the course of the war. And, you know, I left convinced that we're at a profoundly important crossroads for Ukraine, for European security, and for long-term American interests around the world. I think down one road um, with supplemental assistance uh, approved by the Congress lies the very real possibility of cementing a strategic success for Ukraine and a strategic loss for Vladimir Putin's Russia. It's our assessment that with supplemental assistance, uh, Ukraine can hold its own on the front lines through 2024 and into early 2025, um, that um, Ukraine can continue to exact costs against Russia, not only with deep penetration strikes in Crimea, but also against Russia's Black Sea Fleet, continuing the success which has resulted in 15 Russian ships sunk over the course of the last six months. In other words, with supplemental assistance, Ukraine can put itself in a position by the end of 2024, the beginning of 2025, where it could regain the offensive uh, initiative uh, and also put itself in a position to negotiate from a position of greater strength and achieve an outcome in which um, Putin's goal, which was to subjugate Ukraine uh, and to control its choices, would be denied, where Ukraine could sustain itself as a strong, sovereign, independent country, anchor itself in Western institutions, and have the space and the security to recover from this terrible aggression, and leave Russia to deal with the long-term consequences of Putin's brutal and foolish invasion. Down another road, however, without supplemental assistance, it seems to me, uh, lies a much grimmer future. Uh, Ukraine is likely to lose ground, and probably significant, significant ground in 2024. Um, uh, I saw, you know, in the Battle of Abdivka, which, you know, in which, which forced a rushed withdrawal of Ukrainian forces just a couple of days before I was in Kyiv on this last visit, um, the consequences of that. You know, one senior Ukrainian partner described what happened to me. He said that, you know, our men fought as long and as hard as they could. We ran out of ammunition, and the Russians just kept coming. And I think without supplemental assistance in 2024, you're going to see more of Divkas. Uh, and that, it seems to me, would be a massive and historic mistake for the United States. And what lesson do you think? the CCP will take from that? I think the consequence of that will not just be for Ukraine or European security. I think Witness that, will continue. Sure. No, I think the consequences of that are going to be felt not only by Ukrainians and in European security, but across the Indo-Pacific, where if we're seen to be walking away from support for Ukraine, not only is that going to feed doubts amongst our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, it's going to stoke the ambitions of the Chinese leadership in contingencies ranging from Taiwan to the South China Sea. So that's what I saw on this last visit. That's what I think is at stake for all of us. I think the truth is that the Ukrainians are not running out of courage and tenacity. They're running out of ammunition, and we're running out of time to help them. Uh, Director, let's jump to the elephant in the room then. Um, I, I want to thank you for your efforts to secure uh, hostage releases and a ceasefire in the Middle East. Ramadan has now begun. 
um, give us, to the best of your ability, um, a little bit on where things stand with those negotiations and what flashpoints you might be concerned could push us into a, a more regional conflict over the course of the next month? Sure. Um, uh, for the last few months, uh, since uh, the last hostage return and ceasefire in the latter part of November, the president's been working very hard to try to renew that process. And I've traveled eight times to meet with my Israeli, Egyptian, and Guttery partners um, and returned most recently on Saturday night from the last such trip. What's on the table right now is a potential agreement that has three main elements. The first would be the return of uh, about 40 hostages. These are the remaining women hostages, uh, older men, and hostages who are wounded or seriously ill as the first step, as the first phase toward the return of all of the hostages, which I know the president is deeply committed. Um, and that would be in return for a defined number of Palestinian prisoners held by the Israelis. The second element um, is um, uh, a ceasefire of at least six weeks, um, again, as the first step toward what might be more enduring arrangements over time. Um, and then the third element would be a major surge in humanitarian assistance, which under the circumstances of a ceasefire could actually be distributed effectively to people who so deeply need them. Um, so we're going to continue to work hard at this. I don't think anybody can guarantee success. What I think you can guarantee is that the alternatives are worse for innocent civilians in Gaza who are suffering under desperate conditions, uh, for the hostages and their families um, who are suffering also under very desperate conditions, and for all of us. So we're going to keep at this. Thank you, Director. Senator Rich. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I have a number of questions, but uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover here, and mine really need to be in a classified setting because it refer to some classified matters. So I'm going to reserve till we get in, all right, in fine. a closed session. Uh, Senator Heinrich was going to address the real elephant in the room, which are some of our audience members accusing you of pretty serious conduct. So, Director Burns, I want to give you a chance to respond to what's been said. Um, is Israel exterminating the Palestinian people? Um, Senator, all I can say is, you know, what I said before. I think there are a lot of innocent civilians in Gaza who are uh, in desperate conditions right now. I think they're hostages and their families who are also in uh, desperate circumstances as well. And I think I've learned a long time ago in crises like this that you have to find a practical goal and pursue it relentlessly. And the goal the president has laid out, working with our Israeli guttering and Egyptian partners, I think is the most practical one I can see right now is to produce um, a ceasefire of at least six weeks, um, produce the return of the hostages, ultimately all of the hostages, and get desperately needed humanitarian relief to people uh, who need it in Gaza. So, so is that a no, you do not believe Israel is exterminating the Palestinian people? No, I, I, think, I think Israel's, I understand Israel's need, and the president has emphasized this, to respond to the brutish attack that Israelis suffered on the 7th of October against Hamas, against a terrorist group. But I think we all also have to be mindful of the you know, enormous toll that this has taken on innocent civilians um, in Gaza. And as the president has said, it's very important for Israel to be extremely mindful of that and to avoid um, you know, further loss of civilian life. Director Haynes, do you believe Israel is exterminating the Palestinian people? I really don't have anything to add to what Director Burns has said. I fully endorse what he's commented okay. on. Um, Israel, and you also stand accused of starving the Palestinian children. Are you, is Israel starving children in Palestine or in Gaza? You know, I think, Senator, the reality is that there are children who are starving in Gaza. But is Gaza. Israel doing that? Uh, it, they're starving. They're malnourished as a result to the fact that humanitarian assistance can't get to them. It's very difficult to distribute humanitarian assistance effectively unless you have a ceasefire, which is exactly why, you know, I think there's great value in what's on the table now, a return of hostages uh, and um, a significant ceasefire enabling people to get that humanitarian assistance. Okay. For the record, I do not believe that Israel 
nor any of you or the United States government is exterminating the Palestinian people or starving Palestinian children. Director Haynes, um, there have been several news reports, you might say leaks, to the effect that Iran does not have full control of its proxy groups. Um, that's the headline from Politico last month, the quote, while Iran is supporting the proxy groups financially and with military equipment, intelligence officials do not believe it is commanding the attacks. Its lack of control over the Houthis and the militias in Iraq and Syria has muddied the deliberations in Washington about how to respond to repeated attacks on U.S. interests in the region, including the attack in Jordan on January 28th that killed three American troops. But on page 18 of the assessment, the intelligence community writes, Tehran was able to flex the network's military capabilities in the aftermath of Hamas's attack on October 7th, orchestrating anti-Israel and anti-U.S. attacks from Lebanon to the Bab el-Mandab Strait while shielding Iranian leaders from significant consequences. Orchestrating is stronger than anything I've heard. It's not providing support or training or funding. So it's your assessment, the intelligence community assessments, that Tehran has orchestrated attacks on Israel and against U.S. personnel and positions in the Middle East since October 7th? Yes, and I don't think that means that uh, that the proxy groups or that others are always listening to everything that they have to say or under their direct control, but I think orchestrating is an appropriate um, characterization of what they've looked to do. So it, it has, to use the dictionary definition, arranged or directed the elements of a situation to produce a dire, desired effect, especially surreptitiously. That's correct? Okay. Um, Director Burns, on page 34 of the assessment, um, the IC notes that the FBI and the Department of Energy have concluded that the most likely origins for the coronavirus pandemic was a laboratory in Wuhan, but the CIA cannot agree with that conclusively. Why can't the CIA reach the same conclusion that the FBI and the Department of Energy have reached? Yeah, no, our analysts continue to look at this very carefully. They have not yet concluded that there's definitive evidence on either side of this, whether natural transmission or lab accident as well. Um, we continue to pursue, you know, more intelligence, more information that might help them to reach a definitive conclusion. But right now they're, you know, they, they haven't been able to reach that. Director Ray, why are your analysts so much more confident? Uh, our analysts did very rigorous work involving a whole slew of uh, experts of different sorts. Uh, we reached the assessment with moderate confidence, and we stand by that assessment. Thank you. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you, and as others have said, thank you to the people who, who operate under very difficult circumstances around the world to supply us with this important information. Director Burns, I just want to say I, your statement to Senator Heinrich about the the impact and long-term consequences of our abandoning Ukraine is, is important and I think should be required reading around here. The implications are it's a 50-year mistake that would haunt this country both in Europe but also, as you suggest, in, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, including Kim Jong-un uh, would assess that we didn't have the staying power. He's already making noises about the peninsula. Uh, Director Ray, Director Ray you, you talked with Senator Rubio about TikTok. Uh, just to reiterate, it's dangerous because it allows the Chinese Communist Party to have access to an enormous trove of data about Americans. That's number one. Is that correct? That's one of the pieces of it. There, there are several. And but. the second piece is the, the power that the, the misinformation and uh, sort of policy direction that it enables uh, the Communist Party to uh, exercise, correct? Well, I think the second piece is the, is the algorithm, right? In other words, the first is the data, the second is the algorithm, the third is the software. But the problem is, is not TikTok, it's the control by, by China. If TikTok were divested and owned by an American company or a Belgian company or a British company, we wouldn't have uh, this level of problem, is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, the uh, who controls Mexico? Are the are the is the government of Mexico in control, or in the are the cartels in control? And and how do we how do we get at the the problem of the drugs, the the, the fentanyl? By the way, I did a little calculation a minute ago. 
About 15 people have died in this country of overdoses, mostly fentanyl, since this hearing started an hour and 20 minutes ago. That's how serious this problem, one a day in my state of Maine. How do we get control of this, this problem? I'll start, and because there are a lot of us, obviously, that are working to um, help support those who are on the front lines of this, which include the FBI, obviously, and DEA and DHS and others who are really focused on this question. But on the first point, Senator King, with respect to Mexico, I mean, I think there's no question that it is a challenge for the government of Mexico to uh, to deal with the um, cartels. And there are parts of the country that are effectively under the control of um, the cartels in certain respects. And yet, at the same time, I would say that our cooperation with them has improved over time. And I think um, Director Burns and Director Ray may have more to say on this, but uh, but this is an area where we've really been able to work with them to try to we, help to... Uh, obviously, yeah. it, it, we have been able to work, and we, it's improving, but this is a drastic problem that should be treated as such in terms of the impact uh, on Americans. Yeah. Uh, how it, maybe this is a DHS question, but uh, Director Ray, do we know how fentanyl is actually getting in? Where is it? Where is it coming? You mean coming? Well, yeah. How does it get into the U.S.? It's coming through a variety of means, including at ports of entry. Um, but there's a variety of ways it gets in. The part of the challenge of fentanyl is, of course, how small it is and how easy it is to conceal and how easy it is to be innovative in ways to get it across the border. The vast majority of the fentanyl that's killing Americans is, of course, coming from Mexico. And the vast majority of the precursors for that fentanyl is coming from China. Well, I, w I should mention that in the supplemental that's uh, pending in the House, which we always focuses on on Ukraine. There's also a major fentanyl uh, uh, blocking uh, provision that would be very important to this country to get to to be have enacted uh, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Director Haynes, you're nodding, but the record doesn't show nodding. Can you? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. It's not coming to the intelligence community in that case, but there are it, it, funding, obviously, for uh, the capacity to do greater detection and things like that that DHS would be uh, deploying, I believe, and among others, and absolutely agree that this is a fundamental issue. Um, and we are, yeah, we can also talk more in closed session, I mean, about some of the organizational things that we're looking to do but, to improve But we have capacity. a major bill to address fentanyl in that supplemental, if we can get that out of, uh, out of its uh, limbo in the House. Uh, General, one, one, one question. I'm concerned about a gap. NSA can, can talk about foreign intelligence gathering not in the U.S. Here's my worry. A St. Petersburg, Russia uh, troll farm sends or hacks information in the United States through a server in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or California. Does that create a gap? Talk to me about the relationship between yourself and NSA and the and and the uh, and the FBI. I, I just worry that that there's a there's a place there where we may we may lose contact. Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. So so if we think about this right now today in the context of, of threats to our elections, uh, we spend an enormous amount of time collaborating across all the elements of the U.S. government to make sure that we're aligned and that we're appropriately using our authorities to be able to, to garner whatever information is required to be able to identify a foreign threat. First and foremost, we are going to collect that threat of a foreign intelligence target outside the United States. And so one of those tools that really assist in this type of scenario is Section 702 and our ability, because if in, in, by its very nature, if there's an origin of that threat, that there's a foreign entity communicating uh, within the within uh, the United States with a communications provider, it offers us an opportunity under Section 702 to target that foreign intelligence threat outside the United States. And so with the reauthorization of Section 702, that would ensure one means by which we are able to see the foreign part of that communication. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cornyn. Director Ray, I want to ask you a little bit about some of your testimony about the border. Um, last year, 169 individuals on the terrorist watch list were detained at the southern border. So far this year, it's been 58. Um, 
We know there were, since 2021, approximately 1.8 million gotaways. In other words, not people that turn themselves in claiming asylum, not people paroled into the interior, but 1.8 million migrants who were evading law enforcement at the border. Can you tell us, can you tell the American people with any certainty that there are zero people on the terrorist watch list that were among that 1.8 million gotaways? Well, what I would say is you, I think, rightly highlighted um, the kind of what, you remember Secretary Rumsfeld used to refer to the known known, the known unknown, and the unknown unknown. Um, and I think here, in many ways, the national security ramifications of the issues at the border are better reflected in some ways more by what we don't know about the people who snuck in, provided fake documents, or in some other way got in when there wasn't sufficient uh, information available at the time they came in to connect the dots is almost more significant in our view than the actual number of, of so-called KSTs, because those people, for the most part, are stopped, detained, uh, and processed appropriately. And I guess you would get, answer the same way that people with criminal records, members of uh, criminal street gangs and others, uh, being among that 1.8 million um, figure for um, migrants who got away. We don't know what that 1.8 million is composed of, do we? That's correct. What we do know is that more than 37,000 Chinese nationals were detained at the U.S. southern border in 2023. That number's up 10 times over uh, the earlier tally. And um, these individuals who were, of course, detained, sometimes they claim asylum, sometimes, they, sometimes they're paroled into the interior. But again, we don't know uh, how many Chinese nationals that uh, may be among that 1.8 million gotaways that have made their way into the interior of the United States. You would answer the same way. I right, we don't, we don't know what we're dealing with. In that particular context, it gets especially challenging because uh, presumably within that group, you've got not only people who may mean us harm, but also people who are fleeing the CCP and, and uh, share our concerns about their authoritarian thuggishness. That, of course, that's an important point. I'm not suggesting all of them are, but I'm just suggesting this is a huge gaping vulnerability in our national security that we don't have answers for. I'm reminded that uh, there were 26 coast conspirators uh, in the 9-11 attacks against the United States, uh, killing 3,000 people, 26 people killed 3,000 Americans on 9-11. I worry that among the people that are coming across the border, that are evading law enforcement, that there are some people among those that mean to do us harm. Do you share that concern? I do. And in fact, according to uh, public sources, this is CNN, August 30, 2023, you alluded to this earlier, about uh, dozens of migrants from Uzbekistan that were being facilitated by a suspected ISIS agent in Turkey that was uh, assisting those migrants to make their way to the southern border and into the United States, correct? So that's a, a threat stream that we're very concerned about. We're very actively investigating, working with DHS on both people whose travel was facilitated, but also members of the facilitation network in some other way overseas. Uh, there's probably more I could share on that in closed session, if you would like. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I think this reveals is that our border situation, the uh, illegal immigration, has changed over the years. It seems to me, coming from a border state, years ago, you would look at people coming across who wanted to work, wanted to provide for their family, now, of course, we understand people fleeing violence and poverty, things like that. But also, we see the pull factors, the fact that if you make it to the border, you can likely stay for the rest of your natural life, is an enormous magnet for people to come. But also, um, and not just people who have benign intentions toward the United States who want a better life, but also people that want to do us harm. Um, I know sometimes people say, well, this is just a, a consp this is just a fantastic uh, a theory. It's uh, no basis in reality. Do you consider that to be a frivolous consideration? 
I do not. I, I, we, and I've been, I think, very vocal about this. I, we, of course, are not responsible, FBI, for the physical security of the border. We work hard to be good partners with DHS uh, on that. But there are a whole host of threats that emanate from the border. Um, and some of them are criminal threats. We talked about fentanyl and violence. And then, of course, we have concerns uh, that it could be a vulnerability that uh, terrorist organizations could seek to exploit. I would add that we are not at the moment tracking any specific terrorist plot uh, coming across the border in that regard. But it wasn't that long ago, uh, as you will recall, that we had indictments uh, of an individual who was trying to smuggle uh, foreign nationals across the border to assassinate former President Bush. Uh, so it goes to your point that numbers are important, but numbers don't tell the whole story. Uh, it only takes a few people who can be responsible for a whole lot of harm. Senator Bennett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for your service. Director Burns, uh, the FBI director, just mentioned President Bush. I think you were his, our ambassador to Russia when he was president. Is that right? And yes, sir. You yes, have sir. one of the longest career, distinguished careers in American diplomacy, and now you're in the middle of a negotiation in the Middle East that I think everybody up here hopes that you're going to be successful about. In that context, I want to ask you about the supplemental bill that has the Ukraine funding in it. That's a bill that passed out of the Senate with 70 votes. We almost don't pass anything around here with 70 votes, a broad bipartisan recognition of the importance of that bill. I agree with your assessment and the intelligence community's assessment that um, Ukraine has the possibility to prevail in this conflict with Russia. Nobody two years ago would have believed that, but the way they fought, uh, the way they've been able to be supported by our munitions and our intelligence um, obviously has made a difference but they have succeeded in ways nobody could have imagined. There are people here, and there are people in the House that don't believe that. They don't, you know, they, they, their assessment is different than the intelligence community. Their judgment is different, and that's fine. We, we have different judgments. But I would ask you, since you're here, uh, a little bit about the negotiating posture that Ukraine, the West, NATO, wants to put ourselves in with Vladimir Putin. And considering that question, I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about whether or not our, neg our negotiating position, if you're somebody who gr believes in the end that somehow Ukraine can't prevail, although I believe they can, uh, and, and believes only that they can be in a position to negotiate an end to this, why it would be better for us to pass the supplemental from that vantage point than to fail to pass the supplemental. No, thanks very much, Senator. I mean, I think today, first, I'll start with Vladimir Putin and Russia. I don't, it's our assessment that Russia is not serious about negotiations today in the sense that they may be interested in the theater of negotiations, but they're not really interested in negotiating in the sense of compromise right now. Because as Director Haynes said in her opening remarks, I think President Putin believes that time is on his side, that he can grind down the Ukrainians and wear down the rest of us. So if you look at the prospect of a more serious negotiation in the future, it's essential for Ukraine first with our support to disabuse the Russian leadership of the notion. In other words, to puncture his confidence that time's on his side, to demonstrate that for Russia also, there are long-term consequences to this war. They've already suffered enormously in terms of their military, 315,000 plus dead and wounded, four times uh, the casualties that the Soviet Union suffered in a decade of war in Afghanistan, uh, the destruction of something on the order of two-thirds of their pre-war tank inventory, and long-term economic consequences, which you know is fast making Russia the economic vassal of China. Uh, not to mention a much stronger uh, and bigger NATO that they have to face today. So the challenge in 2024 is helping the Ukrainians not just to hold their own, but to continue to impose costs so that they'd be in a position of greater strength, greater leverage in a negotiation. And I think that would be my answer to that question. If you want to get to a serious negotiation, 
you have to help the Ukrainians demonstrate that Putin's wrong in his notion that time is on his side. That logic seems fairly compelling to me. Let me ask you another question. Since you served Republican and Democratic presidents over many decades, you hear people in this building say that the United States of America um, has to give up on our support for Ukraine uh, in actual conflict with Vladimir Putin, in actual conflict with Russia because f uh, of the fear that we will not be able to afford um, some plausible but nevertheless theoretical conflict with China in the future. Do you believe the United States of America cannot handle uh, our commitments with respect to Ukraine and NATO and uh, be able to deter uh, Beijing as well? Uh, no, I don't believe that. I think we're entirely capable. I mean, Senator Rubio said this earlier. I think the United States, while we may not have uncontested primacy in the world today, you know, we still have a stronger hand to play than any of our adversaries or rivals. So I believe we're entirely capable of continuing to support Ukraine uh, in a conflict that has consequences well beyond Ukraine and European security. And I think Sustaining that support for Ukraine not only doesn't come at the expense of deterring China, it actually helps to deter China, whether it's in Taiwan or the South China Sea or other places. It is our assessment that Xi Jinping was sobered, you know, by what happened, especially in the first year of the war. Uh, he didn't expect that Ukraine would resist with the courage and tenacity he d that the Ukrainians demonstrated. He didn't expect that the United States, whom he believes is a declining power, would step up in the way the president has led uh, with all of your support uh, to show solidarity with Ukraine as well. That's had an impact, I believe, far beyond Ukraine or European security, and that's really what's at stake today. And I, I would say we'd look back, Mr. Chairman, at that $60 billion and say that it was a bargain compared to what we would otherwise spend. Mr. Chairman, my yes, colleagues, sir. my colleagues, I think almost all of them went over a minute and a half. So let me just say in the last 15 seconds that I have that the th our threat assessment mentioned. I, I think the record will stand corrected. You, you get a couple seconds, but we've been holding here. Uh, 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 Director Haynes, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll take it for the record, but there is in your, in, in, in the document, uh, reference to the serious issues that we're confronting in space right now. And had I more time to ask you about that, I, we'd have a conversation. You'll get a chance in classified. Senator Moran. Chairman Warner, thank you. Uh, Director Burns, I was in Mexico about a year ago and met with President Lopez Obrador. And my request, among others, was that he personally intervene with China, Chinese leadership and ask for the precursors to not be imported into Mexico and thereby utilized and ultimately end up as fentanyl in the United States. He committed to doing that. My understanding from uh, his government as well as public sources is that he did. Uh, and is there, and then there seemed to be some level of interest on the part of China in <laughs> negotiating with us or having conversations with the United States about that topic I don't know that much has come from that, but you may tell me that I'm wrong. What explains the Chinese unwillingness to be more proactive in combating precur precursor chemicals coming to the U.S.? Uh, is this, um, do they have the capability? Are they intentionally inflicting harm on Americans in America? Is there some quid pro quo that they're looking for? No, I think, Senator, I mean, since the president met with uh, President Xi in November in California, there have been some signs of, you know, greater Chinese seriousness about dealing with this problem, effectively enforcing their own law, because that's all that we're asking. Um, when I was in Beijing in late May of last year, I raised this issue very directly with my counterparts as well. And so I think there are some signs that the Chinese are beginning to address the problem, not just of precursor chemicals, but also of pill pressing equipment. Um, certainly they can do more, and I think that's why it's so important for all of us to continue to push as hard as we can, and to make clear, as you indicated earlier, that this is a problem not only for the United States, but for Mexico and for others around the world. 
So what would be China's reluctance to actually crack down on those exports? Well, I mean, I hope that what you're seeing now is a readiness to do more, I think, since November. But I think, you know, that's something that obviously from the president on down, we need to continue to reinforce as hard as we can, because they do bear some responsibility for what's happening uh, in our own society. General Cruz, uh, how do you assess the current balance of military power between um, in the Pacific today, the United States and China and others? I think I would describe the balance of power today as China is on a rise that it has been planning for multiple five-year periods and it has executed that development, that training, that exercising in a way that has put them in a position uh, that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, in accordance with Xi's own goals, uh, they will be uh, a world leading military power. Uh, the United States though is the world's leading military power today. And so the imperative piece for us is to be on that same trajectory uh, to match them stride for stride and ensure we stay ahead of uh, the growth that we see in China. But there is no doubt uh, the growth that you see and has been discussed today in military power uh, associated with uh, China and the rise in all domains, uh, cyber, space, as well as conventional. Uh, Director Haynes, has Iran, Iran sought to use our borders, our porous borders, to conduct terrorist activities in the United States? Yeah, we have a very good example of um, Iran supporting, in effect, uh, efforts to come across the border um, to go after a former ambassador uh, from Saudi Arabia, for example. There was a, a case um, against our Bob's here in that scenario. Um, so they have historically attempted this, but it's actually been very challenging for them. And, uh, and something that we consistently monitor on a regular basis. They prefer to go through, to the extent that they're able, um, sort of uh, criminal entities and other uh, groups as a way of trying to achieve their goals. Um, Director Ray, um, there was reports of our military technologies being utilized in North Korean military equipment found in Ukraine coming from Russia. How do we explain that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely tracking a similar instance in terms of uh, Iranian drones, for example, where U.S. technology uh, has appeared as components. I think part of it has to do with um, dual-use technologies uh, and companies here not being uh, perhaps as vigilant as they need to be about the potential uses of their technologies. And so, you know, we're trying to be very heavily engaged with the private sector to uh, make sure that they're more thoughtful about who they're selling to and where their pieces and components may end up. Senator, Senator Warner, even though you gave Senator Bennett additional time, I'll not ask for any. You're a very generous member. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I want to thank the panel for your testimony today and also for your public service. I'm going to follow up on the, the fentanyl, and, and I want, want to ask a related question about xylazine. And I know our colleagues have mentioned um, and, and asked questions about fentanyl. But I'll start with direct, Director Ray um, to direct your attention to this question about fentanyl. The, the threat assessment this year on page 36 says that Quote, China remains a primary source for illicit fentanyl precursor chemicals in pill press equipment, uh, unquote. And then it goes on to talk about what the cartels do. Uh, it's noteworthy, I think, that the U.S. Sentencing Commission told us that in fiscal year 2022, 88% of fentanyl trafficking offenders were U.S. citizens, 88%. In fiscal year 21, 86% of fentanyl trafficking offenders were U.S. citizens. But we know how it gets here. We have a pretty good sense of how it gets here. We also know the administration announced that it had made um, progress, some, they believe some progress in reestablishing coordination with the Chinese government on countering fentanyl. Um, I'm increasingly concerned as well about uh, xylazine and other non-fentanyl synthetic opioids. Xylazine as, as many people know, is a powerful veterinary uh, sedative that is mixed with illicit fentanyl. And unfortunately, the city of Philadelphia has become almost ground zero for the proliferation of illicit xylazine. 
According to DEA, xylazine was detected in nearly half, half of all fentanyl-related overdoses in Philly. So, Director Ray, I wanted to ask you, is, it, is the Chinese government holding up its end of the bargain in cracking down on illicit, illicit uh, fentanyl traffickers? Well, I would say the scale of the problem that we're continuing to see uh, suggests to me that there's a whole lot of room for improvement from the Chinese government. Let me just put it that way. Uh, you mentioned xylazine. Uh, certainly, xylazine is of concern to us. You're right uh, that the Philadelphia area is a place where we're seeing a certain amount of that. We've got a lot of investigations in the Philadelphia and uh, Newark areas. Um, of course, one of the problems with xylazine, uh, as you I'm sure know, is it's not responsive to Narcan. Mm -hmm. So that just adds to the challenge. Um, and certainly, xylazine has been found in drug combinations and I think maybe uh, 48 of the 50 states or something. Uh, and it's, you know, very easy to buy, unfortunately, online from China-based suppliers. So I think that just adds to the problem. We are, in addition to our investigative work, trying to engage uh, in your area uh, and nearby areas with hospitals and state diversion groups and things like that to try to raise awareness about it. Um, but xylazine is not a controlled substance currently under the U.S. Controlled Substances Act, so that's just an additional kind of aggravating circumstance. And also a related question, to what extent is regulation by China of xylazine and other non-fentanyl synthetic opioids part of U.S. law enforcement's discussions with their Chinese counterparts? Certainly uh, trying to work with the Chinese on their controlled substances listings um, is a key part of it. And a part of the problem with precursors, of course, is that there's an almost infinite number of variations that people can come up with. So even if there's, when they schedule things, uh, you see new ones you know, uh, crop up in their stead. And so I think that just adds to the challenge. Um, you know, You ask how serious are they? I would just point to the sheer volume that we're contending with, uh, and I think that tells you all you need to know about how serious the Chinese are so far, so far, in helping us address the problem. And Director Haynes, I want to ask you about Iranian um, evasion of sanctions. We know that in, since the imposition of increased sanctions against Iranian oil in 2018 and 19, Iran has been increasingly successful in finding ways to evade uh, sanctions and its oil revenues are increasingly rising. I know the administration's focus on blocking uh, Iran's oil exports. How is the intelligence community supporting the administration's efforts to impose further costs on Iran, including by focusing on, on identifying and sanctioning so-called ghost fleet vessels carrying Iranian oil and Chinese refineries uh, purchase, purchasing Iranian oil? Thank you, Senator. Yeah, I mean, we're very involved is the short answer, but the longer answer. And we actually do um, periodic reports to Congress that tell you about some of the work that we do in this area where we're identifying where we see sanctions evasion, where we see opportunities for uh, essentially uh, additional targets for sanctions that might be acted on, you know, that are sort of third parties or others who are involved in these transactions so that um, the Treasury Department and others can, in fact, uh, go after them in that respect. And it's a constant and critical issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Lankford. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. The team that you work around, please pass on our thanks and our gratitude to them. They work very hard. Most folks will never know who they are and not get a chance to be able to say thank you. So please pass that on uh, as well. I, I do want to continue some of the conversation about the border because while we're dealing with worldwide threats, we're seeing the worldwide threats coming towards us uh, and some obvious vulnerabilities in this. Uh, as has been mentioned, talked about in the past, in, well, in this fiscal year, 58 people on the terror watch list that have been identified and picked up. There's also a category called special interest aliens. Director Ray, I know you're, you're familiar with that as well. Uh, the special interest aliens, let me, uh, many people may not know this definition. I'm just gonna read it, uh, what this designation is. It says the special interest aliens, a non-US person who based on analysis of travel patterns potentially poses a national security risk to the United States or its interests. Uh, often such individuals or groups are employing travel patterns known or evaluated possibly have a nexus to terrorism. Do we have a listing of how many people uh, have crossed our southern border that we have identified in this fiscal year that are special interest aliens? 
Director Ray, do you know that number? I don't know the number, uh, but I, we could follow up with you to see if that's a, something we could provide. It has been one of our challenges to try to identify that. While on the terror watch list, uh, we can get that number and know that it's 58 exactly. When we ask the issue of special interest aliens, we're told often that is law enforcement sensitive. We know the number is in the thousands, but have not been able to get a specific number nor a specific tracking on that. So that'd be helpful to be able to know because the next question is the obvious one of those individuals that they're coming in, and I'm just going to give you the, a number if it's in the thousands. Is the FBI contacted when these individuals that are coming across our border released into the country because the vast majority of the SIAs, we don't have a criminal background information on them. We have a theory, so they're released into the country currently. Is the FBI kept in contact from DHS and others who those individuals are or what kind of tracking and monitoring is on those individuals? I know that we work closely with DHS, especially CBP, on the issue of special interest aliens, including uh, a whole lot of work on the other side of the border to try to prevent them from coming in in the first place. And I know there are instances where we're contacted, but I, I'm not sure that, I, as I sit here right now, I can tell you that we're contacted in every, in every instance. Okay, that's helpful. Mr. Strongman, you haven't got a lot of questions today. We need to give you some, some, need to give you some attention here. Uh, obviously, the State Department is very engaged in this and trying to be able to figure out for the intelligence side of the information sharing. Those individuals that are crossing the border right now, from many of those countries, we don't have any criminal information on these individuals. Do you know, how, just offhand, how many countries that are coming into the United States when they're crossing our southern border, we have criminal background information? Let me give you, for instance, Venezuela. We were talking about Venezuelan gangs earlier and those individuals that are crossing into the country, many of them being paroled into the country. Is Venezuela freely sharing their criminal records with us? Do we know if these individuals have a criminal record? Thank you, Senator. Um, I don't know exactly if Venezuela is sharing specific information with us. What I can say, though, about Venezuela, obviously, is that we've seen you know, over 7 million Venezuelans emigrate from the country since 2017, a significant portion of whom obviously have, uh, have uh, emigrated to the United States uh, illegally. Um, but when we do get relevant information from our counterparts at DHS and FBI, and our, our analysts use that to help inform their judgments. It's one of the challenges that we have as well for individuals, for instance, currently Nicaragua is not taking people back on that, and we're all dependent on State Department to impose some sort of consequences on Nicaragua to say you're a recalcitrant country, you're not taking people back on that. Do you happen to know any of the conversation right now between Nicaragua and the United States on trying to deal with recalcitrance? Because we do have a, a tracking of some that are have criminal records that are coming towards us and to consider that a threat. Senator, I don't have specifics on the uh, details of engagement with Nicaragua. Happy to follow up with you offline. That'd be great. Thank you uh, very much for that. Director, let me, let me come back to you and talk a little bit about CFATS. This is a, a, an acronym most people don't know, the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards. We've had that since 2007. It expired in July of last year and has not been reauthorized yet. One of the aspects of that is for a chemical facility, refinery, whatever it may be, uh, they have the ability to be able to check against the terror watch list uh, using this authority on that. With that expiration, there's about 9,000 people a month that used to be checked on that, just in the hiring and the process of all over the country. We have about 63,000 people, we're estimating, that have not been checked. My question for you is, do we have any idea how many people show up as a, as a hit on the terror watch list from the hiring in the past? Uh, that w when we do that check on it, which now is not occurring because we've not reauthorized this, how many folks do ping on that terror watch list? Uh, I'm not sure I can give you a number sitting here right now, uh, uh, but I will tell you, I, I share your concern about the lapse in the authorities. Um, and the, one of the challenges of this particular space is, of course, it doesn't take many right. for it to be a real problem. Uh, and we rely on that authority, or we historically have, to protect. Right. Could, uh, could, yeah. you say, could you say that number is not zero as far as how many people have pinged on the terror watch list when that, when that has been run in the past? Correct. Yeah, thank you. I think you've given a number of the witnesses' homework assignments there. Um, Senator Jill Moran. We're doing by, if you want to defer to Senator Kelly, be happy to, but we are doing by seniority. Mr. Chairman. Um, in New York's capital region, uh, the Albany Nanotech Complex is set to house some of our nation's most advanced electronics 
research, development, and manufacturing, in particular fields like wafer processing, manufacturing, and lithography tools. Today's annual threat assessment points out that China currently lags behind the U.S. in developing the most advanced chips, giving them cause to steal our technology, which we've seen them do over and over. I included legislation in last year's NDAA requiring DOD to establish a pilot program to enable collaboration between the NSA's Cybersecurity Collaboration Center and the U.S. semiconductor manufacturers to improve the cybersecurity and semiconductor design and manufacturing process. Um, General Ha, how is the NSA working with the FBI to create safeguards against espionage and cyber attacks at leading public research facilities and at semiconductor manufacturers? Senator, thank you for the question. So, so in terms of how we think about the China cyber threat, um, it is clear that they are going to be relentless to, to intend to steal intellectual property. Um, and so from our perspective, part of what it, uh, NSA is really focused on doing is illuminating that threat. So we have done a series of unclassified advisories with a number of partners, elements across U.S. government, six other nations, multiple companies, to illuminate that threat in a way that allows us to get now unity of action against that threat. Unclassified reports to allow increased unity of action. So from the FBI's perspective, they're a teammate in, in everything that we do that talks about the cyber threat within the United States. Um, and from a specific look at semiconductors, critical technology that, that clearly China wants to catch up on and from our perspective, an area that we will continue to identify those threats and communicate those both through the FBI and then through unclassified advisories wherever we can. Director Ray. I would just add, agree with everything General Hawk just said. I would just add to that. We have uh, set up counterintelligence task forces uh, in all 56 field offices, including uh, in the Albany uh, area. Uh, and NSA is a key participant with us in the, our national effort in that regard. And one of the, in addition to the unclassified information that can be shared through the good work that we do together, uh, one of the advantages to the FBI uh, engaging with private companies is because we get information from so many different sources, there are times when we can share information with a private sector entity in a way that helps protect NSA's sources and methods just because that doesn't clearly get identified as this is something NSA told us. Mm. Um, research from the Center for Countering Digital Hate found that the leading AI image generators create election disinformation in 41% of cases in which they are prompted, including images that could support false claims about candidates or election fraud in spite of controls we've been told have been put in place. This is for the entire panel. Um, have any of you seen foreign adversaries with intent to use generative AI, either images, videos, audio, to deceive American voters? What are we relying on to advise the public when this inauthentic content appears? Uh, Director Ray, you can start. Uh, well, I, I want to think about what I could say here. I mean, certainly uh, AI is something that uh, uh, all of our uh, most significant adversaries are taking a hard look at to enhance their efforts. Um, uh, we have seen AI used in a variety of settings, whether it's been used specifically to target voters. I'm not sure that I could say that, uh, but we are actively concerned um, about that as the latest wrinkle in a longstanding effort to engage in information warfare. Director Burns. Yeah, I mean, another example is um, we've seen evidence that um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has used AI to generate videos uh, aimed at inspiring lone wolf attacks as a result to the Gaza conflict as well. Director Haynes. Yeah, I think another example is Russia deploying AI tools in the context of their influence efforts in Ukraine. And there we've seen, for example, I think it was in March 2022, there was a, a deep fake of the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, asking Ukrainians to lay down their arms and ultimately had to be actually uh, countered by President Zelensky in order to address Did we it. give them the information or capability to do that quickly? The Ukrainians? Yes, we worked with them on that. General Hawk. So in terms of, of how we're thinking about AI security, uh, NSA established an AI security center. Part of that is to be able to generate and, and communicate to anyone that is building a model in the United States from an AI perspective, what are those threats? And what are the security mechanisms to ensure that with, uh, 
to avoid misuse of those models. We're also using the AI Security Center for how we apply all of the ethical and safety standards of, of how the department will leverage AI, but really uh, the last component would be how do we communicate to those companies the threats that they will have of their technology and how it will be employed. So, go ahead. Sure, Senator, quickly, you're right to raise this as a uh, threat, and I think our view of it is that um, tools like generative AI will essentially lower the barrier for uh, actors, state and non-state, with fewer resources to engage in potential election interference. And General Krause? Uh, from a DIA perspective, I don't think I would add anything to what has been covered here other than uh, the counterintelligence portion of that that has a touch point across everything that's already been mentioned. I, I would indicate, Senator Gentleman, um, at the Munich Security Conference, something I participated in, there were 20 tech companies that came together, most of the social media companies, on a voluntary basis to indicate both water, watermarking and willingness to take down AI-generated um, video and voice that were affecting elections, but it was voluntary and the proof will be in the pudding. And, and just for the record, no one said they have a plan to tell the American people or to advise the American people. This committee will be having public hearings on this subject uh, very shortly that Senator Rubio and I have agreed upon. Uh, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you to all of you for your service and to your teams as well. Uh, Director Ray, with regard to PR, the PRC and uh, some recent public reports of uh, significant ag land purchases, um, if these land purchases are accurate, they may very well pose uh, a threat to not only some military installations, but most certainly involved in food production that that uh, takes away from our ability to produce for our own country as well. But just curious about whether or not you are aware or could confirm land purchases by Chinese nationalists within the United States, and are you following them at this time? So uh, this is an issue that we're focused on a lot lately. Um, I think what I would say is we're investigating a number of instances proactively where we're seeing uh, either commercial real estate or land being purchased by those with ties to the PRC uh, near critical infrastructure. And I want to be clear, of course, foreign purchase of land, including Chinese purchase of land, is not itself inherently illegal. The, the problem is the risk, uh, and as has been discussed much here already in a different context, uh, the hold that the Chinese government and the CCP have over its businesses in particular. Um, and so we're particularly concerned about situations where a purchase of land near a military installation, critical infrastructure, something like that, could be leveraged to enable anything from espionage, data collection, or, or worse. Do you know if, if the tools that we have in place today are, are strong enough or capable of stopping these purchases from moving forward? Well, I mean, certainly a lot of types of, of transactions, you know, go through the CFIUS process, but I'm not clear on whether or not that fully extends to all the kind of land purchase situations that we're concerned about. Um, we are working with, uh, CIF, the, through the CFIUS process, when that applies, we're working with the USDA to try to work towards maybe some kind of mandatory reporting regime, uh, you know, that might uh, apply. So I think there is room for uh, plugging gaps that may exist. Thank you. I'd like to also ask it with regard to AI in particular. Look, bottom line is, is it's not going away. It's something that uh, we're going to have to deal with. Right now, it appears as though we lead the world in regard to, to AI capabilities. But most certainly, our near peer adversaries recognize that and they're going to do whatever they can as a shortcut to our capabilities, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. I'm just. It, with regard to the advances uh, with AI right now, I'm concerned as much about China and Russia and their capability to use AI to develop weapon systems that we have never really thought about as being uh, in the forefront of a major and direct threat to the United States. And I'm gonna talk about biologics uh, in particular. 
Um, we know that China and Russia have significant capabilities with regard to AI, and that using AI, you can make rapid advances, as you've noted on pages 30 through 33 in your report, that, 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 that with AI, you can, you can very rapidly develop your biologics. I'm concerned about the fact that, that it may very well be used as a weapon system. I'm not sure who to direct this to, but I'll start with, with, with Director Ray, and if you'd like to pass this on, that's fine. But it seems to me that this is an area that if we're not ahead in time to be able to identify and stop them, that uh, this is probably as much of a threat to the United States as any other realm that we've got today. Well, I'll start, and others may want to chime in uh, more from a military perspective. But what I would say is that from an FBI perspective, one of our priorities is protecting American AI innovation from theft, especially from the Chinese. America leads the world in AI innovation, uh, and AI is often, to Senator Gillibrand's question, for example, about detecting deep fakes. And one of the best weapons against AI is better AI. And so we need to protect that innovation, and we're keenly concerned that the Chinese, which have, uh, as I've testified repeatedly, a bigger hacking program than every other major nation combined, if they steal our AI to power it, it makes words like force multiplier sound like an understatement. And may I just, in, in one last thought, just on page 32 of your report, you make it clear that Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea probably maintain the capability to produce and use pathogens and toxins and China and Russia have proven adept at manipulating the information space to reduce trust and confidence in countermeasures and U.S. biotechnology and research. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panel. Director Ray, I believe you noted this earlier, but do, do you share my view that the threat of terrorism associated with unlawful entry through the southern border poses a serious threat to U.S. national security? Uh, I have, yes, I've testified repeatedly that we are concerned about the uh, terrorism implications uh, from potential uh, targeting of vulnerabilities at the border. How would you assess the present level of threat and risk of a terrorist attack in the United States compared to past periods during your tenure? Well, I, even before October 7th, uh, I would have told this committee that we were at a heightened threat level from a terrorism perspective in the sense that uh, it's the first time I've seen in a long, long time the threats from homegrown violent extremists, that is jihadist-inspired extremists, domestic violent extremists, foreign terrorist organizations, and state-sponsored terrorist organizations all being elevated at one time. Since October 7th, though, that threat has gone to a whole nother level. Uh, and so this is a time, I think, for much greater vigilance uh, than has maybe been called upon of us uh, before October 7th. Is the FBI postured to understand the extent of the terrorist threat associated with the southern border? We've been briefed on some specific threats. Do you feel that uh, you know enough to assure us that the FBI is as well across it as you can be, or do you need more resources? Or do you feel you're flying blind and, and uh, not able to define the potential scope and extent of the threat? I think we are working very hard with our partners, but there's no question that we need more resources to combat the threat. Uh, I'll just give a concrete example. Uh, we, uh, through working with DHS, they collect DNA samples, uh, and we provide kits to DHS to collect DNA samples from the people coming across the border that then get sent to the FBI lab. That's part of why we asked for a significant enhancement because of the sheer increase and people coming across means a sheer increase in the number of samples that need to be collected. That's what helps us identify those people if they're then committing crime somewhere in the United States or as happens all too often, unfortunately, they go back across the border and try to illegally re-enter again. So we need to be able to process those samples quickly. There's a backlog. We asked in the 24 budget for enhancement. Not only did we not get enhancement, there was a 10% cut to the terrorist screening center. So. Uh, Whatever happened in 24 happened in 24, but I would urge Congress as we look at fiscal year 25 that we can't double down on those cuts if we're going to be serious about protecting the border. Well, speaking of Congress, I think it's worth noting that a serious, tough, bipartisan border security measure was put forward in the Congress, in fact, co-authored by a conservative Republican member of this committee, which would have surged 
enforcement resources to the border, which would have provided substantial resources to fight cartels and to crack down on fentanyl trafficking, which would have tightened asylum standards and expedited adjudication and therefore removal timelines for those who were trying to enter the country without a valid reason to. The former president put out the word that he wanted the bill stopped for political reasons, and the bill was stopped. In fact, not only was the bill stopped in the Senate, it was denied even a debate on the Senate floor. And this speaks to the corrosive impact of extreme partisanship and polarization in this country on our national security. So I'd like to ask you, Director Haynes, how do our adversaries view the impact of political extremism and polarization and partisanship on America's strength and stability? We're talking about worldwide threats. Those threats can exploit our own frailties here at home. I think the best way I can answer that question is to point to the fact that we've seen that both Russia and China, for example, have taken an the opportunity to uh, highlight where there's political dysfunction or other issues that they see in the context of our governance and use it as part of their information operations globally, both to sort of highlight, uh, for example, to their own populations that you know democracy is quite challenging and would you really want this at home kind of thing, and also to uh, demonstrate to our allies and partners that maybe we can't be relied on as effectively. Thank you, Director Haynes. Thank you all for your testimony. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, uh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being here today. I've been sitting here since 2.30. There's also, there's often a, maybe an advantage for going last in one of these hearings. Um, I was going to say it was the elephant in the room until, until my colleague from Georgia brought it up. But... Uh, as I've sat here, I've heard most members of this committee ask something about the southern border. Uh, not everybody, but the majority. I spent a lot of time on the border, uh, perhaps more time than maybe anybody on this committee, maybe with the exception of Senator Cornyn, um, who I've traveled to the border with. And I strongly agree with what most of my Democrat and Republican colleagues have said about the problems and the challenges. You know, fentanyl coming north, precursors often from China heading south, violent extremist organizations, uh, Chinese migrants who might be in, you know, Maine, um, selling rather strong uh, marijuana, ISIS, Iran proxies, problems in Mexico. I mean, over and over again, they pointed out all these problems. Uh, and I've worked on this issue, providing more pay for Border Patrol, uh, closing gaps in border wall along the southern border, you know, where they make sense, and they certainly do in a lot of places. More money for NGOs to help Border Patrol. Uh, Director Ray pointed out, talking about how we need more resources to combat the threat. And it helps when DHS gets those resources. And we had the opportunity to do something about it. We really did. More money for technology, including fentanyl detection. More border patrol agents, more asylum, asylum officers, more authorities to rapidly expel individuals. A change in the credible fear standard. More money for de detention facilities. More visas to reunite families. And all this... This legislation was endorsed by the Border Patrol Union. And it had strong bipartisan support. Until it didn't. And my colleague from Georgia points out why it didn't. Director Ray, is it in your assessment that more resources and stronger policy that could help your partners not necessarily the FBI, but DHS. Is that your assessment that that would help deal with all these things that were mentioned in this committee hearing today? Well, I'll leave it to others to speak to policies, but certainly in terms of resources, um, uh, not just for DHS, but for the FBI, uh, we need more resources to deal with all the threats that emanate from the border that we're responsible for. Director Haynes? Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. Director Burns? Nope, I don't have anything to add. I agree. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, yield back the remainder of my time because I think it's, um, you know, the failure of that legislation. That alone 
presents a national security threat to this country, in my view. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Let me thank my members. And let me also just say for a moment, um, we have strong views on this committee. But one of the things I think that we have always taken some pride is that we can agree without questioning each other's patriotisms, without questioning each other's motives. Um, and I, I hope that tenor will be maintained. Members on this side feel very strong. I felt very strong on the border bill. Members on the other side raise legitimate questions about the border as well. I do hope, particularly as we deal with our intelligence professionals, the one thing we've tried to have this committee always do, and I, I frankly I learned from people like Richard Burr, and Diane Feinstein, and Zachary Chambliss, is that that disagreement, at least in terms of the intelligence committee, should not go in terms of ad hominem attacks. Um, I don't think I heard that. I heard huge policy differences. We ought to have those. Uh, but the one thing I hope and pray is that we maintain this notion because the intelligence professionals who never get the recognition they need look to this committee to be, I hope, an island of sanity in an otherwise sometimes challenging political environment. That doesn't take away anybody's views, doesn't take away anybody's right to have those views, but I have enormous respect for every member of this committee, regardless of which side of the aisle they sit on, and we're gonna go at it time and again, um, but I hope we owe our intelligence professionals that, um, that kind of notion that just because we're on different political uh, sides of the aisle, that neither political party has a monopoly on truth or patriotism, uh, and we can have differences of opinion without questioning each other's truth um, or patriotism. And uh, with Mr. that- Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to claim my title, please. <clears throat> well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I can't let uh, this go, uh, the last two speakers on the Democratic side, without responding. Look, th this committee, uh, I've been on this for 15 years, and we do a really good job until politics uh, do creep in. And that's what's happened here this afternoon with the last two speakers. These are the facts. The last president of the United States closed the border. He closed the border down to almost zero crossings by the time he left office. He did it even though he was sued over and over and over again by people from the other side of the aisle. But he shut it down, and he shut it down under the law that's in effect today. Congress has done its job. It passed a law saying you cannot enter the United States without authorization. That's the law uh, today. When the current president came in, we all know he took the policies of the former president, tore them up, and, uh, and rescinded them, and now we have what we have. As far as the bill that's concerned, everybody's talking about the former president making phone calls. He never called me, but I can tell you this. I will not vote for any bill that allows any illegals to cross into this country, and everybody here knows that bill would have allowed 5,000 a day to come into this country. That's not for me. And I don't care if the president calls me or doesn't call me. I'm not, my, my red line is not one. What we need to do is enforce the laws that we have. You want to talk about the front door and how we let them in the front door? I'm all in. But the back door's got to get closed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would simply add that for the former president and a number of my Republican colleagues had repeatedly said to make the kind of changes you need permanently on the border, you need legislation. And that's... And that is an ongoing debate. It's a debate that we'll have here and elsewhere. Um, but I, and what we need, and, and the thing that the most important last comment I'll make, uh, because we will be breaking and going into closed Senate, is we need an intelligence community that's going to never be afraid to tell truth to power. And truth to power sometimes means telling us on both sides of the aisle what we don't necessarily want to hear. Uh, I think you, the, the, the witnesses, and frankly, the men and women, literally thousands of them who you represent, uh, do that on a regular basis. And at the end of the day, while we may hassle and haggle over some of these policy things, the most important thing you've got to do is keep keeping that, speaking that truth to power, even when we don't want to hear. We are adjourned until we move into the classified setting. <laughs>